So um, today, yeah, I want to be talking a little bit um, about the um, the challenges that we are going to face in the post pandemic world. I saw a tweet today, actually, which said um, that the post in post pandemic is a bit like the post in post colonial, uh, which I think is is probably the case uh, in the sense that, yeah, we will kind of not be moving on from the pandemic in any real sense uh, for quite some time. But I just want to talk a little bit today about um, the, yeah, the kind of challenges I think we'll be facing as we move into the post pandemic world and how the kind of leadership that we need to respond to them. Um, sorry, guys, I'm just going to, I just, for some reason, have lost the view on the screen. Um, and I just want to find so I can put myself back again because otherwise I will yeah I was just saying to Owain before this started I have done it before where I've been speaking to the screen and it's cut out and I've not been able to see so I'm just going to try and get myself up on this again we can see you and hear you you can see me okay fine cool yeah right I guess okay that should be fine okay cool I've got it back right good right so uh challenges for the post-pandemic world right I think there are three major overlapping challenges uh, that we will face as uh, we move from the kind of pandemic crisis to uh, the post-pandemic world. Um, and I've grouped these under inequality, climate breakdown, and a crisis of representation or uh, a crisis of democracy. Um, and yeah, I will talk a little bit about uh, each of those challenges in turn. So first, the inequality. Um, now, when we think of inequality, we usually just think of income inequality, but it actually uh, encompasses a whole range of, uh, of different challenges. So yes, there's income inequality, there's also wealth inequality, regional inequality, um, gender and race inequality, and then contextualizing all of that in um, you know, into the, the level of the world economy as well. So inequality at a global scale. Now, there are a number of different drivers um, coming, you know, some of which predate the pandemic, but many of which were exacerbated by the pandemic which suggests that the world in which into which we enter um, as we kind of leave the immediate crisis of the pandemic will be a much more unequal one. So first and foremost, um, some of you may have, have heard about this already, but uh, there has been a massive increase in the savings ratio that has taken place over the course of the pandemic. Effectively, this means that uh, there have been a you know, small number of people, relatively speaking, on a global scale, who have been able to set more money aside, put that money into savings. And that may have been because they kept their jobs um, and saw their, uh, saw their uh, spending habits substantially decrease over the course of, uh, of the first several lockdowns. Um, whereas others have not had that same chance to put more money away um, into savings. We saw this, for example, particularly in the US, where those big stimulus checks that households received, uh, less well-off people, working class households were much more likely to spend those checks on things like debt, rent payments, bills, whilst the wealthier were able to put them aside into savings. So we've seen this massive increase in the savings ratio. And if you go away and look at that graph, it's very astonishing we, because prior to the pandemic, um, savings had kind of stagnated or fallen. Often we were seeing some dis-savings, i.e. many households going further into debt. But it kind of went like this, literally as the pandemic started. The issue there is that those savings are highly, highly unequally distributed. There's some more research that's been undertaken uh, over the course of the last two years, which showed as well that um, this pot of savings, this pot of money, which, again, is disproportionately likely to be held by those at the top of society, the savings of the wealthy are the liabilities of the less well off. So we've got a lot of money that is being saved by wealthier households. Much of it is being invested in financial institutions that ends up being lent to less well off households. And those interest payments are effectively a massively regressive force in society because it's effectively a channel through which um, wealth is uh, sucked up to the top of society. More generally speaking, a lot of the kind of irrationality and craziness that we're seeing in financial markets is driven by this question of what is going to happen to this big pot of money, to these you know, massive uh, pools of savings that have been set aside, again, primarily by the wealthiest um, in society. And that question has been exacerbated by public policy because we've seen uh, extremely loose monetary policy. Um, so this obviously dates all the way back to the financial crisis and in other parts of the world, even before the financial crisis, central banks, creating new money and using it to purchase assets from the private sector. So that 
can take the form of the purchase of government bonds. Increasingly over the course of the pandemic, we've also seen central banks uh, purchasing other assets from across the private sector. So um, corporate bonds, ETFs, um, lots of different assets. And as a result, we've had um, a, a kind of bonanza across asset markets, uh, really, particularly if you look at the US, but more generally across equity markets, across bond markets, and even going into housing markets, especially in those parts of the world where housing has kind of become just another asset class, particularly in, in London property. So again, public policy is driving this increase in inequality, which is particularly showing up in the form of increasing wealth inequality. There is just this huge and growing gap between the people who have assets, have savings, and are able to invest those savings in assets and those who don't. And public policy is, is driving a wedge between those two groups, and it is only going to get worse after the pandemic. Housing is one of the areas where this um, trade-off, where this inequality is most obvious, because you have a small number of people who not only own their own homes, but are able to use that pool of money that they've been able to save up to purchase other homes and the rental payments of uh, people who are, end up living in those homes form a kind of, um, well, a, a rent, a rental payment, literally an economic rent that gets sucked up from the bottom of society to the very top. So this challenge of wealth inequality is one of the biggest challenges that we're going to see. It's going to get worse, actually, as we move into the post pandemic world. Um, and it's being exacerbated by public policy. Another set of factors that are exacerbating this increase in inequality, this time looking at um, income inequality, but also to an extent wealth inequality, is growing monopoly power. And this is, again, something that is being exacerbated by public policy. Um, so over the course of the pandemic, we've seen um, an unprecedented level of um, consolidation across a number of industries, particularly, obviously, the tech sector. And a very interesting stats, which is really kind of unprecedented um, in modern history, is that uh, during the pandemic, for the first time ever, uh, the top five largest companies came to compose 20%, a fifth of the value of the entire S&P 500. That is an astonishing level of market concentration. And it's interesting the way that economists treat this trend because they say, well, as long as it's not having an impact on prices, it doesn't matter. If you take a firm like Amazon, for example, you know, often its business model is based on the fact that it will keep prices as low as possible in order to tempt as many customers as possible into using its service, not primarily as a you know, short-term profit maximizing strategy, but as a long-term monopolizing strategy. And this is something that we haven't seen competition authorities pick up on. They say, if there's not an impact on prices, then it doesn't matter. But of course, we are allowing a small number of very powerful corporations to gain a huge amount of control over society more generally. And you can see that with the big tech companies. You also see it in pharmaceuticals, in agrochemicals and food rising market concentration across a whole number of industries. And again, being exacerbated by public policy, not just competition policy, of course, but also, you know, in, a, in an environment in which uh, money is very easy, it becomes very, very easy for large, powerful corporations to borrow more in order to buy up other companies, invest in financial markets and boost their returns. So again, you have these forces driving inequality, actually even within the corporate sector, as well as within society more generally. Um, I think it was Siv a, a, a moment ago, or maybe Owain, who was speaking about the challenge of automation. There's been some research that's taken place again over the course of the pandemic, which shows that those sectors that were most at risk of job losses from COVID were also those that were already most at risk from automation. So hospitality, retail, these sectors where, um, you know, there are a lot of, um, where there's, there's remains a, a significant dependence upon labor, often uh, relatively poorly paid workers. Um, we have seen over the course of this crisis, as we, as we always see over the course of, uh, of economic crises, companies using this moment of rising unemployment uh, and crucially uh, low borrowing costs, cheap money, to try and undertake a transition towards automation, um, basically towards uh, yeah, kind of removing as much labor from uh, the production process or the sales process as possible. And that, again, is going to be something post-pandemic that exacerbates inequality. When you combine that with the trends that we're seeing across the labor market and indeed uh, when it comes to organizing in the labor movement, you start to see the consolidation of this shift that we saw prior to the pandemic between relatively well-paid, secure jobs that are undertaken by those with a university education and highly precarious, 
poorly paid jobs, um, often in sectors that is very difficult to unionize across the gig economy, but also across kind of hospitality, retail, et cetera, um, that divide increasing even more, the kind of hollowing out of many of those kind of middle class jobs that were relied upon to kind of contain inequality, particularly during the post-war period. And then if you zoom out and look at the way that these trends are manifesting themselves at a global level, the picture is not much better. We've been told for a long time that the story of globalization has been a story of a reduction in inequality between countries, even if there has been an increase in inequality within countries. If we look at what's happened at the global level over the course of the pandemic, it's been very stark. Poor states, um, which do not have the same access to global capital markets at the best of times, have seen money flow out um, just at astronomical rates. We saw the fastest outflow of capital from the global south ever recorded, faster even than during the 1980s debt crisis at the start of the pandemic. And what does this mean? Well, firstly, it means that states that were already in debt distress are now struggling even more to be able to service their debts. So there are a number of countries also, particularly those that are dependent upon commodity exports, Zambia, you know, countries in sub-Saharan Africa that are in severe debt distress. There is a debt moratorium at the moment, but that debt has not been written off and it is effectively unpayable. So debt distress is increasing. The other issue, though, is, of course, that those states that are unable to access international capital markets will struggle to be able to implement the measures to combat COVID-19 that have been implemented in other parts of the world. Whether we're talking about just immediate investment in healthcare and public health, there are lots of states that simply cannot afford to buy ventilators, purchase the equipment that they need to be able to fight the pandemic, or the economic measures that are going to be needed to stimulate the recovery afterwards. Um, powerful states, the UK, the US, Europe, countries in the rich world, have been able to, at least partly as a result of the fact that there is this flight to safety in capital markets, um, borrow huge amounts of money to be able to contain the impact of the pandemic on their own economies. This has not been the case for countries in the global south. So that is uh, is going to you know, set up a, an increase in inequality, both political and economic, between countries after the pandemic. And then, of course, you have the massive impact the pandemic has had on poverty, uh, which has reversed several years of um, improvements that we've had in global poverty. And the World Bank has estimated that the pandemic led to 97 more million more people falling into poverty in 2020 alone. That is a historically unprecedented increase. Moving on to the next challenge. So inequality, I've spoken of just a few drivers of inequality there because I didn't want to kind of, you know, you could have an entire session on all the factors that are driving inequality um, over the course of the pandemic. But climate breakdown, again, um, is uh, a trend that will have different impacts on different parts of the world. Now, just looking at um, the state of play when it comes to climate breakdown today, you know, just what is accepted in terms of the science. We had obviously the IPCC report come out last year and um, the results of that report were there is absolutely no room left for any doubt, complete and utter scientific consensus um, and some pretty terrifying reading, actually, if you look into the detail of the report. So some stats here in 2019, atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide were higher than at any point in the last two million years. Uh, and the scientists concluded that the scale of recent changes experienced across the climate system and much of its present state are unprecedented over thousands of years. Perhaps the most concerning point about the report, though, is the identification by scientists of this series of tipping points whereby carbon sinks, for example, tundra, oceans, places that absor absorb a lot of carbon dioxide are beginning to become saturated. And when those places become saturated, the oceans, for example, absorb about 30 percent of the carbon dioxide we emit. You have a sudden shift in the way that the system works and a sudden and dramatic increase in the amount of carbon dioxide that ends up being released into the atmosphere. The science in that study suggests that we may already be past the point of no return when it comes to 1.5 degrees, but we'll need to work exceptionally hard simply to avoid warming of two degrees. The third and final challenge is a crisis of representation. And again, this links into those other two challenges as well. Um, we have seen across the board in uh, across the rich, rich world, but actually across the world more generally, a pervasive decline in trust. However, trust is measured 
in most social institutions and particularly in kind of democratic institutions, in legislatures, in um, uh, as, as well across the media, across the judiciary. Um, a lot of the kind of governing institutions of our society, if you look at the UK, the US, um, Europe and many parts of the global south, there has been a significant trend downwards across all of those uh, all of those states, particularly in the 10 years since the financial crisis. And what's fascinating as well is that there has been a reported decline in the extent to which we trust one another in many of those societies as well. And those two things have uh, often gone hand in hand, a decline in trust in our institutions, a decline in our trust in one another. We've also seen, uh, you know, across the border pushback against the kind of technocratization of politics that was really a feature of neoliberalism. So if you look going back uh, to what I mentioned in, in the first point about inequality, about much of that, you know, the incredibly unfair impact of monetary policy at the moment, that would have been very difficult to do had it not been for the technocratization of central banking. The fact that during the 1990s, at the peak of neoliberalism, central banking was uh, determined, was deemed something that was a purely technical operation that therefore didn't have to be subject to democratic control. And so was insulated from democratic accountability um, and handed over to technocrats who spent a lot more time talking with and socializing with um, the people they were supposed to be regulating than they did with um, the rest of society more generally. There's a, a very interesting quote coming out of the UK, uh, literally, you know, a few years after independence independence, where a senior economist at the Bank of England, um, after raising interest rates, reportedly said that unemployment in the north of the UK is um, a, a good price to pay for curbing inflation in the south. These are the kind of distributive decisions that are being made by unelected technocrats every day. So it perhaps is not surprising that we hear these calls to kind of take back control and we hear this decline in trust in our democracy. Um, we've also seen, again, and I think this goes hand in hand with this crisis of representation. And this is actually what I'm writing about at the moment, a massive centralization of capitalism. And when I say centralization, what I mean is that power and wealth are becoming increasingly concentrated in a small number of very powerful institutions. And this is true across the economy, but it's also true across politics. Um, so across the economy, we're seeing, obviously, as I've mentioned, increasing monopoly power, um, a small number of kind of uh, powerful firms and financial institutions that are really making decisions every day that affect all of our lives. Um, you know, we have this idea of, of capitalism as, as this kind of free market system where the market is this big, uh, decentralized democratic mechanism for allocating resources. But actually, the vast majority of decisions about production and often the allocation of resources take place within these big, powerful firms. Um, and it, within those firms, there is very little accountability. There is, you know, no democracy. And as a result of the um, kind of attack on the labor movement that we've seen taking place over the last 40 years, as well as the kind of outsourcing revolution that's really broken up the uh, um, the mechanisms of accountability within those firms. Again, there is not there are not uh, very many kind of mechanisms to hold those people who are making these important decisions to account. But we've also seen this across politics. We've seen it both at the level of the nation state, the centralization of power within the executive and also at the international level with a small number of very powerful international financial institutions, for example, like the World Bank and the IMF, making decisions about the policies that countries can and should pursue if they want to get access to, uh, to credit. So these three challenges, um, they are very broad, they encompass a lot of other challenges and they are highly interconnected. Um, and I think they can really be grouped under um, this heading, under this challenge of kind of centralization, of the centralization of power within our, our politics, within our economy. And the question that we obviously need to be asking ourselves then when we think about leadership is what kind of leadership do we need to face these challenges? I think there is a very interesting and potentially provocative question here, because when you think about leadership, um, you know, when first, certainly when I think about questions around leadership, I think about, you know, the kinds of books that the CEOs of these very powerful corporations will be reading to think, well, how can I be a kind of robust, strong leader um, to face these challenges and to lead my enterprise through this, you know, very particular, very, very tumultuous time. But I would say, actually, that is the kind of opposite of the approach to, of, to leadership that we need today. Because if the problem, if the challenge is the centralization of power, then trying to teach our leaders to be better by following a set of, you know, rules and laws that we develop, you know, 
in in, ac- in academia or in you know business studies or whatever that's not going to cut it because what we really need is accountability none of these challenges are going to be solved without accountability and you can't really have accountability unless you have some mechanisms for democratizing these institutions if it is true that many of these challenges inequality climate breakdown a crisis of democracy are being driven by the centralization of power within a small number of institutions then to counter that we need a kind of decentralized distributed leadership that is going to allow the people on on whose behalf these decisions are being made to take back control if you to to use a turn of phrase um and that really requires us to think about leadership i would say in a very very different way if you think about inequality inequality in in our society is not just a kind of you know purely economic question about wages and you know who is able to um, extract the most out of the production process it's a highly highly political question and it's being driven today substantially by oligarchy effectively one of the biggest drivers of particularly wealth inequality during the pandemic and after the pandemic is monetary policy is decisions that are being made by central banks another massive driver of it is Monopoly power is just the massive disparity of power that exists between workers on the one hand and bosses on the other hand. Climate breakdown, again, um, a, a problem and a challenge that is being driven, at least in part, by the massive coordinated power of a few small fossil fuel companies over our democracy. If you look at one of the what was one of the biggest companies in the world, ExxonMobil, ExxonMobil scientists knew about climate breakdown in the 1970s, at least. And after um, Exxon CEO put uh, after Exxon's leadership, sorry, put um, its um, research team onto basically researching what then became known as greenhouse gas effects. When the link was discovered between the burning of fossil fuels and um, and what was then called greenhouse gas effects, money was taken out of that research department and was channeled into climate denialism. And it's only been recently that this has emerged, and Exxon has actually been the subject of multiple court cases as a result of that. How do you tackle that kind of entrenched self-interest and really corruption? It's not ever going to be enough to say, well, these people just needed to be different kinds of leaders. Clearly, the incentives that they were facing, if they were able to do you know, something like that, if they were able to make those kinds of decisions, were not right. And it's those incentives, it's those structures that need to be challenged and reformed. So I would say that the challenge we face today, uh, if we're going to be able to tackle any of these things, we're going to tackle inequality, climate breakdown, um, and the crisis that we're seeing in democracy, is that we need to be able to demonstrate and promote leadership from the ground up, from the grassroots up, really. Greta Thunberg is a great example of this as someone who um, has stood up from, you know, within a social movement and really taken leadership, taken the challenge of leadership as something that involves holding the powerful to account. Um, We see this challenge manifest itself across the trade union movement, across the labor movement, across social movements more generally. Leadership at every level of politics. How do we Um, create this culture of leadership that really is about holding the powerful to account and is about building counter power, not what I think a lot of people think about when they think about leadership, which is investing a small number of people with trust to make decisions on everyone else's behalf. Actually, how do we build the kind of leadership that we'll need for a century in which I think the defining challenge will be how we democratize our society, how we democratize all of our social political institutions. How do we bring power back from the very, very top where it's been concentrated, drag it back down to the grassroots? Because unless we are able to do that, unless we are able to combat these forces of centralization that have brought us to the position that we're in today, then we will simply not be able to to develop the kind of politics, let alone the kind of policies that we'll need to uh, tackle the challenges that we face in the post-pandemic world. Thank you very much. Thanks, Grace. That was brilliant and um, really thought-provoking. Um, I, I thought I would I would kick off with a question, but we have had uh, one already from Tristram. But just to encourage people, just type in the in the Q and A box if you've got a question, and I'll I'll try to get to as many of them as possible in this just over half an hour that we've we've got left. Um, 
I mean, I've got so many to ask, actually. I could I could spend most of the rest of the evening talking about Greta and whether we can generalise out from, from her example and her movements example. But maybe maybe just first of all, I'll I just I just wondered, you know, where in the world or or is there any particular activity somewhere in the world you think we can be learning from at the moment? I mean, I know, you know, you can't just replicate one practice worldwide and hope that it will work everywhere. But I'm wondering if there's, you know, a particular example or two of something really kind of inspirational that you think, yeah, actually this this could kind of work to democratize our economy a bit more. Yeah, so the, the model that immediately pops to mind is actually community wealth building. Um, and the one of the best examples of that in the UK is Preston City Council. Um, so the whole idea behind community wealth building is really to push back against the centralization and technocratization of power that we've seen within the state over the last 40 years. Obviously, a big part of that has been the outsourcing model um, that a lot of councils have relied on, basically kind of um, cutting the provision of services in-house and outsourcing them to big companies like Capita, you know, um, InterServe, etc. Um, and in doing so, that model not only ended up, you know, basically worsening outcomes across the public sector. Uh, the National Audit Office has done a lot of research into what a bad deal outsourcing often is. It also really broke that chain of accountability between the public and um, their service providers. So that was a, a, a real challenge that um, community wealth building, uh, you know, people interested in community wealth building were looking to solve. Um, and it was initially trialed across um, a number of parts of the US and it came over to the UK to Preston City Council, which was really facing quite a substantial crisis. Um, it was facing a budgetary crisis. And then there was a, a, a deal that was supposed to kind of redevelop the area that fell through. And kind of on their um, literally last legs, I suppose, uh, Preston City Council decided, and Matt Brown, the leader, decided they were going to go for this quite radical option of trialing community wealth building. And what that involved was re reversing this logic of outsourcing by saying, we're going to bring services in-house um, we are going to provide as many services as we can locally, and we're going to try and keep as much value locally as we possibly can. So the council using its power as a procurer to boost cooperatives, to boost uh, workers, uh, sorry, um, uh, enterprises with good relationships with their workers that are unionized to boost uh, businesses that have a good carbon footprint. Matt Brown has now spoken about trying to build community banking as something that's going to be really important to uh, continue facilitating that and just really making sure that the democratic link between the local council and local people is strengthened. And the results of that have been really, really astonishing. So not only has there been a, a really significant economic impact in terms of the, the spend that the council is undertaking, it's creating many more jobs locally than it otherwise would have, certainly um, than it would have if it had been spent on capita or whatever, which just, just would have ended up as kind of profits in the pockets of, uh, of its senior executives. But also when you look at people's attitudes towards democracy locally, there is just so much more trust. And it's not a coincidence that um, in the last uh, local elections, uh, Preston did really, really well, bucking uh, a nationwide trend. And when you asked voters about that, they said, well, you know, we can see the council is doing a lot for us and we feel like our voice is being heard. We feel like, you know, we can see that we are being represented. Um, so I think that was a really interesting example of the kind of leadership that we need, right? Um, not just you know, on behalf of the campaigners who really pushed for this to take place, but also on behalf of, you know, the leaders of the council. It's very easy, I think, to be in a position of relative power and think, right, well, this is my fiefdom. I need to hold on to as much power as possible. But I think the challenge for, uh, for leaders today is thinking, how can I create mechanisms that can allow myself to be held to account, even when that's difficult? And that requires a lot of... Um, uh, well, uh, of kind of conviction and and, and stamina, I think. Um, and, you know, what they've achieved in Preston is really a testament to what can happen when you put the meat back on this idea of, of democracy. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, it is really useful, actually, to have a concrete example, isn't it, of, of kind of democracy in action, because I guess, you know, the critique of, of democratic approaches to leadership is that we, you know, kind of just end up, talking our way around and, and, and around and around problems that that we kind of don't have time to address in many ways and, and kind of what I like about your 
breathing is that you do bring in a kind of really hard economic and material kind of interpretation of of leadership which can involve you know doing things with resources as well as as well as just talking and that was just an aside because I've we've, we've suddenly had quite a lot of points and questions I'm going to start with the most uh with the with the first person who posted that was Tristram from from Brighton Tristram says, in Stolen's conclusion, you said control over the state must be used to disrupt the power relations that undergird the existing order and build up new institutions. Aren't cooperatives and mutuals that already exist a possible already existing example of these institutions? Can't we disrupt power relations, therefore, without control over the state, but through mass movements, investing in co-ops and mutuals, taking capital away from private finance and into common ownership and accountability? So yeah, so I guess Tr Tristram here is 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 making the case, or at least um, asking that we consider the role of um, non-state actors such as co-ops in in democratizing. Yeah, it's absolutely um, important that we focus on um, already existing institutions, and I do that actually in my latest book. Look at parts of the world where um and and, uh, and and companies and um and co-ops and mutuals where this kind of democratic form of of organizing and management is already being tried um and there are a lot of examples actually of, of um often sometimes quite large corporations and institutions that have sought to govern themselves based on democratic principles and have done so extraordinarily well um however trying to scale up those examples or spread those examples is always very difficult. Often it relies on networks that exist in a particular area or within a particular company. Um, it's often kind of linked to particular historical processes. Um, and, um, you know, one of the big difficulties actually is, is kind of information sharing and um, sharing what works across these different examples of kind of democratization. So if you're thinking of, for, for example, how to set up a mutual or how to uh, transform a firm into a worker owned firm or how to kind of democratize your, your local council. These are big, big challenges and without very strong local networks and um, kind of, uh, you know, organizing and, and building up power at the grassroots, it can be very difficult to replicate from one context to another. So I think it's very important, actually, that we do look at these examples and look at what works and try and spread best practice, which is actually what the kind of community wealth building network in the UK is trying to do. Um, the issue is, is that we still need to focus on democratizing um, other larger, more powerful institutions, as well as building up new ones, because the state financial institutions, um, you know, big businesses are such huge allocators of capital in our society. They are obviously um you know, the main promulgators of law, law not just being state law, but also forms of private law, um, and just have such a huge role in making massive decisions that affect all of our lives. That is going to continue to happen. You know, the environment in which these mutuals and cooperatives operate is an environment that is created by the state and by large private enterprises. The extent to which they're able to borrow, one of the biggest challenges co-ops and mutuals face in scaling up is access to finance. Who shapes access to finance? financial institutions on the one hand and the state on the other. Um, so yes, it is very important to look at what works um, when we are building up new institutions and how we can kind of spread that knowledge and, uh, and use it in other contexts. But uh, you're not going to see real transformative system change unless there are also campaigns to transform the way that other larger powerful institutions work. And I think that what is required when we are kind of thinking about organizing in that context is as well as a mindset around creativity. So kind of building new things. We also need a mindset around disruption. Um, and particularly, you know, when you're thinking about big, powerful firms, um, you know, like, for example, Amazon, right? We've seen over the last couple of days, um, two employees have died in Amazon warehouses and the company is basically still tweeting about going to space, right? So, yes, we need creativity, but we also need a mindset that's oriented towards disrupting these practices, disrupting the exercise of state power. You know, we've seen in the UK as well hugely regressive, regressive rules being introduced around citizenship that are really the antithesis of, of how democracy should work. So these things need to be resisted because the way in which power is concentrated at the moment means that um, 
you know, that power will be used against movements that try to push back against the status quo, even if you're doing so in a way that looks relatively harmless. Um, so, yeah, I think we need to kind of combine this much more kind of creative, less oppositional mindset with a more um, with a more one that's oriented towards resistance as well. Thanks, Grace. Yeah, that that really chimes with something that a, a colleague, Charles Bartold, and another couple of colleagues and I were writing about around decentral leadership when we uh, had a conversation with some authors like Keith, who, Keith Grint, who's just posted on here. Actually, I'll get to him in a sec. And this, this idea, actually, in leadership, sometimes the leadership can be a very embodied physical thing that involves doing things in particular spaces that disrupt and and disjoint rather than just you know rather than just sorry as if talk isn't hard enough but rather than you know talking away through problems um i've got a, a, a question from and I, I think jonathan had a had a question which was a very open how but i think we're kind of getting there slowly jonathan so i'm going to park that for a second and move on to nathan harter who um, says the sense of suspicion of centralized authority can manifest in populism, as for example, Brexit. I predict that many in the audience would find these reactive spasms in politics as harmful, even though they are responding in their own way to many of the same threats identified by the keynote speaker. Is it possible that as scholars, we can make common calls with such movements? So um, what do you think, Grace? Well, I think it's all about processing, about how we process the way that these um, these threats and challenges are made sense of, basically. Um, you know, if we think about the rallying cry behind Brexit, right, this idea of take back control, the right has been extraordinarily successful at manipulating the response to a crisis that they themselves created. So, um, you know, the financial crisis and the kind of assault on democracy that followed that and indeed preceded it was very much the result of the kind of neoliberal revolution. And the pervasive decline in trust in politics that we've seen since then was also used by the right to push this kind of very reactionary, xenophobic movement around Brexit. But, you know, you see it more generally across the world now, the kind of anti-globalization movement um, that is pushing back against, uh, yeah, kind of any form of um, uh, cross-cultural mixing or, um, you know, just any spreading of, of people and, uh, and ideas around the world. Um, that the success that the right had being able to, to do that was a directly linked to the failure of progressive movements to provide a narrative around what was going on in people's lives and say this is the solution. So I wouldn't say we could join up in any way with those movements, but what I would say is that we need to be identifying the problems correctly and being able to um, vocalize solutions. Um, and a lot of people um, on the left, I think, will have responded to um, these questions around kind of like take back control and uh, the, you know, fairly reactionary and, and xenophobic um, lines that often go along with that by kind of saying, and you see this actually quite a lot in, in progressive spaces, uh, that actually we need to listen to the experts. We need to kind of, you know, Brexit is going to be something that's going to harm everyone. And here's the, the science and here's the economics and kind of deferring to other leaders and other experts basically and I think doing that whilst it might seem particularly appealing to you know especially those in kind of academic and intellectual spaces to say well actually no that isn't correct look at this evidence um it doesn't answer the real um I suppose kind of you know, emotion and and feeling that underpins that call to take back control, which is this sense of alienation and disempowerment, right? Um, so it'd be easy for progressives to say, you know, basically pitch, and this is what I think we've been doing for quite some time now, uh, to pitch um, our arguments as a kind of direct opposite to those of the right and say, they want X, Y, and Z, we want, you know, A, B, and C. Um, but I think the challenge is much deeper than that. It's actually about answering those questions of alienation and disempowerment by saying, we think that we should build a more democratic society. It's not just about 
asking people to vote for this person so that they can solve everyone's problems. It's actually about saying we want to hand power back, whether that's, you know, decentralizing our politics, handing power back to local administrations, whether it's building up the trade union movements, so kind of decentralizing power within organizations, democratizing our public services, all of these different sorts of things, and actually saying, You know, we want to build a society based on these forms of decentralized and distributed power, not just answering calls for, you know, um, answering kind of a reactionary movement with a movement that is a kind of top down technical response to that that points out all of its flaws. Um, So, yeah, you know, I think we need to be aware of the challenges and questions that are motivating a lot of these calls to kind of take back control and these this general suspicion around politics. You saw in the US as well, this kind of drain the swamp reaction against politics in general. That needs to be understood, but it needs to be interpreted. And that process of collective interpretation and movement building that takes place on the back of that is in many ways much more important than the answers that we actually come up with. Thanks, Grace. I'm going to just, um, I, I guess, insert a slightly provocative one before I move on to the next couple of questions, which is, uh, th- does the world have time for this kind of leadership? Or, or is uh, you know, are the tipping points um, in climate change so acute, maybe, that actually people like us who talk about democratizing leadership and so on might in in a funny sense be be part of the problem well i think the attitude that we often see which is that speed requires and kind of you know forceful reaction to a problem requires centralized leadership um is really really wrong and you see this actually quite a lot across kind of Um, development studies and and, um, political science more generally it's this idea that you know you need a strong man to be able to solve any of a nation's challenges right and wherever this happens often you get an initial attempt to respond to this particular challenge but it just ends up ends up creating more challenges down the line and the reason for that, I mean, you know, when you're, you're talking about any social system, any environmental system, you're talking about a complex system. And acting within complex systems means that if you just have this fairly rigid, top down authoritarian model of leadership, you're going to cre- end up creating problems in other places. When you pull on one lever, you won't know that that's going to create all these different effects and all these different other parts of the system. The response to that, I think, um, is not what we've increasingly seen across our politics, across our economics, which is to say, which is just to say, right, okay, well, make sure that we have one person who has their hands on as many of these levers as possible, because it's just impossible, it's never going to work. It's actually creating a resilient movement for change, creating one that will create lasting change across all of these systems, means creating a democratic movement for change, um, one which um, you know takes in information from lots of different parts of this system and allows lots of different um, responses to kind of come out of that and build momentum on the back of that. That's actually why I think organizations that are democratic end up being much more successful because they're able to respond much more proactively to what happens in their environment. So you know you might say, well, to respond to climate change, we need one guy making all the decisions. But who has the ear of that one guy? Exxon Mobil is much more likely to have the ear of that one guy than, you know, climate campaigners and organizations. Um, So there's that question of of capture. And even if, you know, the right people have the ear of that one guy, what if the answer to that question ends up being, right, okay, well, we'll just do carbon capture and storage or um, spray, um, you know, uh, aerosols into the atmosphere and do mass scale kind of um, geoengineering? What are the kind of long term implications of that going to be? So, Democracy, I would say, is and and democratic movements, democratic movement building is a precondition for any of this stuff happening. And yes, it has to happen quickly. But in many ways, we're already seeing that happening quickly. Um, And a lot of what is kind of, you know, described as just talk or just protest or whatever ends up creating these big social shifts you know if you just look back to a couple of years ago climate change was not nearly as on the agenda as it is today how has it gotten so high on the agenda it's basically been because of social movements social movements democratic social movements that have forced uh, us all to start paying attention to these things so i think actually that question around like do we need basically authoritarianism to uh react to these challenges with 
the level of speed that we need is is asking the wrong question. Yeah, I think it definitely was asking the wrong question. But I know that you didn't mean it though. You were just being provocative. I'm not I saying do, I do. In my, in, my, in my darker days, I do, I do think along those lines. I know it's wrong, but I can't help myself. Um, I, I think that latter point you made is really interesting because I think sometimes a lot of us are quite tempted to look to kind of existing organisations and institutions for answers or how do we revitalise this trade union or that university or that organisation. And sometimes the energy... I think as you've just illustrated and, and possibilities for the new is coming elsewhere, be that in a, in a new social movement, Fridays for Future or, 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 or whatever it might be. But um, I, I just want to move, I want to move on now to, we've had a few more um, points and questions. So Keith Grint, who's going to be joining us as, um, as our final keynote speaker on Tuesday, has said, um, I wonder whether the problem is really just about leadership or whether we need a different form of followership. In effect, and apart from the issue in the UK of a democratic system that places majority control from a, from a minority vote in the face of passivity and fatalism amongst followers, you get the leaders you deserve. And I guess I just want to follow that up briefly by saying I've, I've heard a few people, and it's hard to completely disagree, with this, that, that have said something along the lines of, well, Boris Johnson in the UK at the moment has got in trouble for these, these you know, parties or, or non-parties, whatever you want to call them. But actually, compared to, you know, his, his a track record of other things that he could have been pulled up on over the past sort of couple of years. But I just did, it did get me thinking, really, about the role of followership, similar, similar points to the ones that that Keith has made here about passivity and, and fatalism and you get the leaders you deserve. So I wondered if you had anything to say to that. Well, I mean, I think the reason that we're hearing so much about this particular, you know, Christmas party fiasco is because it is um, a critique of the government that the media are very comfortable with. The media is, of course, not, you know, most senior journalists are not going to be comfortable critiquing the government on areas of policy around, you know, migration or economic policy often because they themselves are in favor of a lot of the policies that the government is promoting right so a huge amount of our media ecosystem is geared towards pushing the kinds of policies around regressive policies around migration um and actually even on the economy that uh the government has been pursuing so i'm not surprised that the one bit of you know pushback we're getting against this government has been around it's something that is very easy for the political class and the media class to kind of understand and, and talk and think about a kind of classic political scandal rather than these much wider questions around around policy. But that 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 question, particularly around do we need a different kind of followership because everyone is so passive and, you know, people aren't paying attention or they're not as outraged as they should be. I think that that is the result of um the kind of atomization that we see in highly individualistic societies of the kind in which we live, where the problems that we're facing are very, very complex and they require that um, grassroots organizing in order to be able to combat. And yet you face the world, you face all these really complex challenges as just one isolated, atomized individual who is told that, you know, you are just you, you aren't part of a society, you're certainly not part of a movement or a trade union, because those have all been destroyed. And that is designed to create passivity and fatalism. That is why we have, at the very core of neoliberalism, this idea of just the homo economicus, the one heroic individual going out into markets and doing their own thing. The way to combat that is, funnily enough, just by engaging people in organising, as soon as you go from just being one individual who's, you know, is like in, in their own little household, doing their own thing, doing their own job to organizing in a trade union or organizing in, the, in your community, you start to conceptualize yourself and your role in society in a very, very different way. And I've seen this time and time and time again in terms of being in social movements when new people come in, you start to feel more hopeful. And even if you don't feel more hopeful, you certainly believe that the route to change is not just, you know, um, trying to like, I don't know, stop using plastic straws yourself, right? Which is exactly the kind of like activism that would be encouraged in a highly individualistic society. But it's actually by participating in this movement. When you start participating in movements, you start seeing, oh, wow, there are all these other people who are just as concerned as I am with all these issues. And you start often seeing 
that you really can make a difference, even if it is just a tiny difference, like stopping your local library from being closed. Um, that can make a massive, massive difference in terms of how fatalistic you are versus how optimistic you are. Um, so, yeah, I really don't think the question is necessarily uh, just it, I don't think the problem is just oh, people are too fatalistic, so they get the leaders that they deserve. I think the problem and the challenge is individualism and the solution is just getting all these fatalistic people to come together as, you know, as much as we can in social movements, in trade unions, to show how much they can achieve. Um, you know, the last time I think we really had some of these strong social movements in the UK was probably around the 1970s, um, where because of the strength of the labor movement, because of the relatively more um, democratic ways that we had of organizing the economy and organizing society. So if you're a you know, trade unionist, you might have some experience in actually collective bargaining at the level of the state or engaging in decision making that would take place within your organization. Um, working people had much more confidence in their ability to shift the way that the economy works. And we saw that when you got the neoliberal shift and there was mass strike action across society that ultimately, you know, the only way that the state was able to combat that was literally by using the power of the police, the power of the military to kind of push down and, and restrict this strike action. But that was really a time where I think you saw um, successive gains that had been made by organized working people, giving actually more confidence and more of a sense that they had the capacity to change the status quo. The position that we're in now, one of fatalism, is really the result of, you know, years of basically working people being beaten down. But I think that a lot of the organizing that we're seeing, a lot of the social movement organizing that we're seeing and trade union organizing that we're seeing now, um, in which there's been a, an uptick over the last couple of years, is starting to push back against that. And I think that's the only real cure to this um, question of fatalism. Yeah, thanks ever so much. And there was that there was a case, wasn't there, of a Starbucks store, I think, on yeah. the weekend unionizing, which was a really interesting example of um, a more kind of precarious hospitality uh, businesses, people, workers having a bit more agency. That could be the beginning of, of something. Who knows? But um, let's see. OK, we've got um, uh, a, a question from an anonymous attendee. Very mysterious and exciting. Um, some of the information and stats you've mentioned, Grace, are very interesting, but it's the first I've really heard about uh, about some of them. And I like to stay reasonably informed. How important is it that this information is seen and heard by more people to inform them and that this change, oh, sorry, I, I've, I'm not reading this out very well at all. My I can see it, don't worry, yeah. <laughs> oh, you can see it, okay, well, I'll, I'll, let me read it out for everyone. Anyway. How important is it that this information is seen and heard by more people to inform them that this change is needed and how can that be achieved? Yeah, well, obviously I think it's very important. That's why, that's what I do. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, you know, we don't have the kind of media ecosystem that we would need to be able to make a lot of this stuff common knowledge. Um, now, we've obviously seen that when it's come to, you know, questions like around around the climate, for example. Um, but, you know, it's equally true today when we're when we're thinking about all of these challenges. What I would say is that I'm encouraged by um you know, the kind of new media that we have and the reach and the scale that it is getting, and also the platform that that is providing to people who can then go on, you know, out into mainstream media and, and push some of these messages. Um, there are a lot of reasons to be hopeful, I think, about kind of democratic alternatives to the mainstream media um, in the UK and around the world. The UK is actually kind of not is relatively far behind in terms of building up new media organizations as compared to somewhere like the US or parts of Europe. Um, so I think that's, that's really how we need to think about getting this conversation spread much more widely. Again, the right has been much more successful in using new platforms to build a kind of alternative media organizations. But I think the left is catching up. And I think there is demand for it. There's huge demand for it. People are really, especially young people, young people quite broadly defined, very sick of basically watching kind of, you know, standard mainstream media push the same kinds of stories and responses to those stories that they have been for the last several decades and are increasingly looking for new ways of getting their information. 
And yes, that means using social media, which has ups and downsides. But if we're able to build kind of new democratic media organizations that can leverage those platforms um, to get that information out and to start those debates, then you do start to see change. Um, and you do start to see, in fact, there are a lot of people I I'm, I know who have been kind of radicalized politically um, just by kind of engaging with stuff on social media. So that is the first step, I would say. The second step is then, of course, getting people from that, those kind of online spaces into organizing uh, in, in, in real life. Um, but I am encouraged by the growth of, of new media organizations, not least the one for which I work, uh, Tribute Magazine. Yeah, and your podcast is terrific. So just encourage um, people watching to check that out if they can. So um, actually, Fidel's uh, points and questions are, qu are quite similar, but I'm wondering if there's a slightly different cut at this. I'll, re I'll read it out anyway. So um, Fidel, who's going to be presenting a paper later this evening, a very good paper, has said, how can we get new leadership without addressing the issue of ownership of the media that controls the narrative? The media has normalised dictatorial tendencies of some among our political elites who have gone native and are promoting culture wars to prey on the fears of those who may have lost out because of globalization. So I guess culture wars is maybe a slightly different way into this, the role of culture wars in the media and, and leadership. Yeah, I mean, um, those on the right are really like fans of saying that, oh, it's lefties who are pushing all these culture wars, but actually the culture wars um, are disproportionately started and maintained the the, the uh, you know those flames are fanned by those on the right who see it as basically a kind of convenient distraction to have us talking about I don't know Meghan Markle or um you know some other manufactured controversy rather than the substance of of policy um, and that is yes kind of reinforced and, and and fed into by the media one point there actually I would say is that I remember um, one political journalist speaking to them and, and they were basically saying, look, we do stories based on what politicians are saying. And if the opposition isn't saying anything, then it's difficult for us to be able to kind of hold the government to account because we'll be accused of bias. So there is actually a kind of question there around the kind of politics that we have and whether or not the opposition is holding the government to account as well as just the media. But more generally, you know, we can't rely obviously on mainstream media to be able to give the kinds of in-depth, interesting, structured um, view of these challenges and, and responses to them. Um, but again, you know, I don't think that that is, um, is, you know, necessarily all bad because we have these amazing new media organizations that are much more democratic and much more responsive to their viewers. And as social media um, kind of grows and as many of these media organizations grow, that is going to become truer. There are only a few standard, um, you know, normal mainstream media organizations that are not shrinking at the moment. And that's basically the Financial Times and The Economist, right? And um, now I've thought for a very, very long time that we need something like an economist of the left. Uh, I would be kind of very excited if we'd be able to, to, to do something along those lines. But certainly already, you know, there are a lot of new media outlets that are out there catering to um, this need for a different kind of debate, whether it's on economics, climate, culture, whatever. Um, and they are really corroding the market shares of these more established incumbent media organizations. And those organizations are going to have to respond if they want to survive. And if they are going to have to survive, they're going to have to start really, again, I would say kind of democratizing themselves. If we're moving towards this model, like, for example, The Guardian is of trying to say, right, well, we want people to donate. People who are donating to keep that organization alive are going to want to have some influence over the way that it's structured, right? So again, I think we need to really be pushing this line around democratizing the media. And that can happen both by kind of challenging within existing organizations, but also building up new ones. And of course, those new, um, those new organizations can also act as um, uh, kind of testing beds and incubators for you know, young, diverse, working class voices who can then themselves get into mainstream media and start challenging things from there. There's a great organization called Neon, the New Economic Organizers Network, who does does media training um, with kind of progressive voices, particularly from disadvantaged backgrounds um, who, you know, are then trained up and, and go out into the media and start challenging some of this stuff. So that also is, is, is really, really encouraging.
Thanks, Grace. We've got a minute left. So I, I'm, I'm wondering, um, you, you've addressed a lot of the, you, you've addressed at least some of the themes from your new book already, but I was just wondering if you wanted to, to share with people um, sort of a bit of a tease what your new book's going to be called, when it's going to be coming out, some of the, one or two of the main arguments. I don't have a title yet, but that is a story for another day. I will be finishing the first draft by the end of the year. So I am really kind of, you know, on the brink of, uh, of finishing right now. But basically, um, the book is really taking apart the distinction between free markets on the one hand and central planning on the other and saying that actually capitalism is a system that is characterized by per pervasive central planning. It's just uh, undemocratic. So it's central planning that takes place within large multinational corporations within financial institutions, within powerful states, within kind of international organizations. Um, and, you know, absent that justification for capitalism, which it, which the, is that it is a free market system and the market is a kind of democracy, then we need to really be thinking about how we democratize these institutions within which so much power is concentrated. Um, because, yeah, there's kind of the level of centralization, the level of yeah, just power that exists at the very top of our society um, really undermines this idea of the free market, undermines the justification for capitalism on the basis that it's a free market. And I think creates a real um, uh, well, it should create a real impetus towards saying these people are making decisions that affect everyone's lives. The CEOs of powerful corporations, financial institutions, senior politicians, bureaucrats, they need to be democratically accountable. And that requires us to democratize our economy, democratize the firm, democratize finance, and it requires us to democratize our politics and democratize society more generally.